So our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Debbie Page Dumrose. She's a research soil scientist with the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station up in Moscow, Idaho. Her research focus has been on long-term productivity of forest soils and sustaining forest growth after harvest and site preparation. She holds a BS in natural resources management from Grand Valley State University, a master's in forest soils from Michigan Tech, and a PhD in forest soils from the University of Idaho. Her title of her talk today is Using Fire to Build Soil Carbon and Water Holding Capacity. So let's welcome Debbie. All right. Whew. All right, so we're going to talk about loss of function in soil and what we can do about it. Um, and then we're going to talk about learning from a biochar model um, and what biochar tells us about um, what we can do at a landscape scale. And then we'll talk about how to increase water at that landscape scale. But before I start, I want to tell you a story. Um, and so if do all of you know what biochar is, some of you do. So, um, so the story I'm not going to tell you is that we started to think about biochar about 10 years ago because of the finding of the terra preta soils down in the Amazon where they had intentionally put charcoal, organic matter, all kinds of things in tropical soil. And for 10,000 years, those soils have been much more productive than the native soils. I'm not going to tell you that story. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, wait. No, what I want to do, though, I still want to go back in history. And I want to tell you a story about um, when Jimmy Carter was president. And when he was president, um, one of the things, he had a radical idea that the United States should not be dependent upon fossil fuels and that we should um, maybe think about bioenergy. Pretty radical, huh? Um, but to do that, he knew that we needed to have some research done on national forests to figure out how much bioenergy could we, how much biomass could we take off forest sites and still maintain productivity. So he actually funded Forest Service research, which, you know, we give him kudos for that. Um, and, and maybe over a beer later tonight, we can talk about um, environmental policy in the United States <laughs> and, and why we're still trying to catch up from back in the late 70s, early 80s. But part of that work um, was funded a project at the Corum Experimental Forest, which is in western Montana on the Flathead National Forest. It's by Hungry Horse, Montana, not too far from Glacier National Park. And, and so back in the late 70s, um, there was a bunch of biomass harvesting going on. They did shelter wood cuts and clear cuts. They did whole tree harvesting, and they did um, lop and scatter. They also did prescribed fire. And the whole goal was to see how much organic matter could you remove from a forest site and still get trees to grow. Um, so early on in that um, work, there were some a group of folks from Moscow and Missoula, the Forest Products Lab, Michigan Tech University, who did work at the Corm Experimental Forest. And they wrote a paper that was published in Forest Science in 1982. And um, in that paper, they said, um, you need to leave, you land managers, need to leave about 10 tons per acre of woody biomass on the soil surface. How many people remember that? Yeah, a couple, a couple, yeah. That's still in a lot of forest management plans to this day that we need to leave big wood as parent material on a site. Um, some people often confuse that with, oh, we need to leave this big wood because it increases stand productivity. Eh, not so much. It's, you know, it's a big hunk of carbon, right? But what it does do is it, like I said, it forms parent material for, um, you know, as it decays, it moves into the forest floor and then into the mineral soil. Um, but one of the things that also happens is that when there's fire, that wood turns into charcoal. charcoal. Oh, good job. <laughs> I, should say, I should have, like, stickers or prizes. <laughs> um, that's right. It turns into charcoal. And, and so uh, in addition to talking about how much wood should be left behind as parent material, because it was you know, biodiversity and um, fungi were always found in this decaying wood, that's where a lot of moisture was, they also found um, deep soil carbon from past um, wildfires and prescribed fires on the forest. And, and so there were layers of charcoal that held a lot of moisture, and there were just little chunks of charcoal. You know, it depends on where you're sampling. Um, some was right below the forest floor, some was deep in the mineral soil, um, but always that charcoal was associated with higher moisture content and higher biodiversity. And, and so, um, so keep that in mind as I go through my talk today that, that leaving that wood is part of the key to the, the question about how do we increase soil water. 
So let's look, let's look below ground, see what's going on. So there's a lot of things that happen um, to degrade soil properties. You know, it's, it's physical changes, compaction, erosion, um, sealed surfaces that reduce infiltration. There's chemical changes that happen when we damage the soil, um, acid rain, um, saline soils, nutrient leaching, contamination from whatever we're mining. Um, and then there's biological changes, the loss of biodiversity, increase in soil pathogens, changes in greenhouse gas, gas fluxes because um, the soil is sealed or more compacted, the gases don't move around as much, and certainly loss of soil carbon. So oftentimes it's the, it's the whole continuum of those three things that are really affecting how soils respond, how they hold water in the landscape. So, what, about, what, what should a, a healthy soil look like? Healthy soils should have about 2 to 10% organic matter content. Um, but right now, because of all sorts of things, harvesting, agriculture, grazing, 75% um, of our soils now have less than 2% organic matter. And more than 80% of those soils have lost greater than 50% organic matter. Um, healthy soils should have at least about 40% total pore space, and so that changes as we compact or graze animals, uh, or recreational vehicles, all of those things change the total pore space in the soil. Um, nutrient levels have fallen by about 10 to 100% in a lot of soils, and of course we need microbes to convert those soil nutrients into plant available nutrients, and so um, you know, 80 to 95% of those nutrients that are acquired by plants are microbial mediated. So who cares about healthy soil? I'm going to say we all do, right? Because we all want to see these restoration um, efforts succeed. So what do we do about it? Um, before we talk about what we do about it, I, I want to throw some more numbers at you. So um, if you think about soil as a sponge, if we you know, at a minimum, if we lost only 1.5% of the organic matter, we've lost the ability to store more than 31,000 gallons of water. And so you're thinking to yourself, how do you figure that out? Well, luckily, the NRCS has this little infographic that says if you increase your soil organic matter by 1%, you can increase water holding capacity by 25,000 gallons of water per acre. It's pretty mind-boggling, right? And so 25,000 gallons of water per acre, it's, you know, that could make a difference. Um, and, and so, um, you know, and it varies by soil texture, but not a lot. So 25,000 gallons is an average. But if we've lost more than 5% of our organic matter, which many soils have, we've lost the storage capacity for about 125,000 gallons of water. So, so we need to think about, you know, what's happened to our soils. And we kind of know that, but you know, our goal, I think, should be how do we bring back that productivity, that ability to act like a sponge to hold water, um, to think about how soils could then um, hold water that's now coming as rain rather than as snow melt-off, and how that could change water delivery to our streams. So, um, so there are several ways that we could build soil functions again. Um, some of that agriculture is doing now with cover crops. Um, they're doing it with adding compost, no-till um, agriculture, those kind of things. That's really hard to do in forest and rangeland sites, right? We, we don't have that ability. We don't do that intensive management on a lot of our forest sites. Um, and so maybe a different way to think about that is adding biochar. Um, we could probably do that on a lot of sites that are pretty close to roads or easily accessible. Um, rangeland sites are relatively easy, but maybe you know, that's not something that you would do on a you know, big watershed scale. And so um, maybe we could do that with charcoal. And so what, we're, what our goal is, though, is to restore those soil functions. We want decomposition, we want bioturbation, worms moving stuff around. We want to increase nutrient cycling, water holding capacity. That's what we're after for this talk, right? Um, and then we, we increase those ecosystem services by um, changing runoff and infiltration. We have less erosion. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about um, how we can increase the growing season for understory plants by having more organic matter in the soil. And of course, if we have green understory, then we also have a reduced fire risk. 
So biochar, we, we know how to make, Darren could come up and give us a primer on how to make biochar in kilns and um, small scale biochar production um, in woods or on the range. Juniper, um, we've, we've done a lot of this in Nevada with some small kilns. Um, and there are a lot of bioenergy plants around, uh, mostly in California, I guess. Some are in Oregon, um, not so much in Idaho. I'm not sure about Utah. Do you have a, yeah. So large scale biochar production really isn't there yet, but we're, we're gaining on it. But there are places that are making truckloads of biochar and um, selling it to farms to increase water holding capacity. So, so we, we know how to make biochar. Um, I think we know how to make charcoal as well, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so, so really biochar is an equivalent to native charcoal in forest ecosystems. It's, you know, it's, a common, it's common to find char in the soil in those places that we've burned. Um, I, I suspect, although I don't really have the data for this, I suspect that fire suppression has reduced the amount of charcoal inputs into our soil. We don't have as much now as we should. Um, there's also, um, you know, charcoal on the soil surface moves in the water and um, burns in the next fire, but um, not as much as I think that we've lost by the long-term fire suppression. Um, and if we do whole tree harvesting and take all of the wood off, and uh, remember I said we should leave 10 tons per acre of biomass after harvesting. If we're doing whole tree harvesting, we're not leaving, in a lot of cases, we're not leaving that biomass behind. And so we've lost that source material to create more, bio, more charcoal. So here's the cool thing about biochar, or charcoal for that matter. Um, it's, it's incredibly porous. And so it holds nutrients on exchange sites. It's often got a lot of negative charge, so it holds cations really well, calcium, magnesium, potassium. Um, it holds nitrogen when it's in the ammonia form. Um, and so on this over here, we've got wood charcoal, just straight out of the, you know, off the soil. And here's activated charcoal. The thing about activated charcoal is that what they're trying to do is increase more of that pore space. And so that's what you would use in your fish tank, right? Activated charcoal. Or the straws that you use to clean water if you're out camping. <clears throat> So we, um, when we started working with biochar, um, we were trying to figure out, well, you know, what could we tell land managers about how much more water biochar would hold? And so we just did this simple little column experiment with a couple of, you know, pumice soil had less than 2% organic matter. Um, so here's water retained in the soil column. So this is the water added. We added 2,000 mils of water. And in the control, we ended up with about, um, 750 milliliters of water left. And in the biochar, we had about 20% more, about 1,250 milliliters in the water. I mean, this was just straight biochar, you know, didn't do anything special with it, just mixed it in, poured some water on it. So, so that's a nice story to tell, right? That we're, you know, 20% increase in water holding capacity by just adding about 10 tons per acre of biochar to the soil, you know, the equivalent, mixing it in. Um, here's some work that was done in uh, Ponderosa Pine that also talks about available water capacity here on the y-axis and the amount of charcoal added here on the x. And when it got up to, you know, you could see there's none. It's about 12% available water. Um, five, I know it's hard to see these graphs in the back. It's about 12 and a half. And then 10, ton, 10 grams per kilogram of soil. We're getting to be about 13%. Here's 50. Uh, greater than 18% or, um, water holding capacity in the soil. So it's about a 6% change in available water. And so one of the things I want to make clear, though, is that you know, we say we can increase the available water capacity in the soil. Um, I'm not sure that all of that is available for plants. I think what happens is that because the charcoal acts like a sponge and it's sucking up water and it's holding it in the soil, not all of that is available for plant growth but it certainly is making it so that it's not running off the soil surface and it's not leaching through the soil profile and into the groundwater and it's gone. So it's being held in that soil profile. So once that soil is saturated, then that water becomes available for plant growth. So I wanna make sure that that's clear. Um, here's some work that was done in Montana. Um, how much carbon could you expect to 
produce from different fires and at different intervals. And so the, um, Tom DeLuca had done some work with ponderosa pine and lodgepole pine. Um, and so in the end, what, what they found was that it didn't really matter what kind of forest you have or um, that you could make up for a short return fire interval having the same production rates as a longer fire return interval in like lodgepole pine um, if there was woody material on the soil surface. Right, so that gets back to my story. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm connecting the dots for you. So it gets back, you gotta have some source material there to create the carbon to get below ground to be, you know, to be effective. And so they found that so carbon charcoal formed at the rate of about one to 10% of the biomass that was consumed during the fire. So you, you could see if you really wanted to add a lot of carbon, you'd have to leave a lot of wood on the soil surface. Um, and I'm gonna tell you another story about that, but not yet. You can tell I'm big into stories, right? So examples of some fire to charcoal rates. Um, here's some more. So um, if, if, for example, you had a 10,000 year time frame, your fire return interval was 35 years, so about 285 fires. You created 3% charcoal for, per burn. Um, charcoal's 80% carbon. You could add about 32 tons of carbon per acre over 10,000 years. But yeah, I have to add the caveat, right? Not all the charcoal stays on site. There's some that erodes away, um, burning losses that we talked about. And so we expect that about half of that charcoal that's produced would eventually make its way into the mineral soil and be effective at holding water, nutrients, microbes, whatever you like. <laughs> Everyone has their favorite, you know. Um, so here's some work that was done by Ward uh, in the Bob Marshall Wilderness um, talking about reburns. And, you know, I'd done some work in the scapegoat wilderness on reburns and how much soil carbon there was. And, you know, we, we looked at um, fires that had burned once, twice, and three times over the same place. Um, we, we didn't, I wasn't really thinking about charcoal at the time. We are now and we're going back to those samples. But we found that soil carbon had not changed even with successive reburns. So that tells you that, um, first of all, the, the reburns weren't as severe as we thought they might have been, um, and that they were still enough material that we could continue to get that pulse of organic matter into the soil and, and charcoal. So um, it, here's some data from the Bob Marshall. Once burn, there's about 300 kilograms per hectare of charcoal. Twice burn doubles that. But they had source material, they had parent material on the soil surface that could still produce charcoal for that second burn. So it wasn't a catastrophic burn. And, you know, trees were killed and then they would fall down and they were available then for charcoal production. Um, here's another example that does incorporate some of the data that I had. A bunch of other people, I kind of squished this all together. Um, but no burns, there's about 100 kilograms per hectare um, one or more burns, so this actually goes up to three burns, one to three burns, uh, a significant increase in charcoal in the forest floor. And, and that's where, of course, you'd find a lot of it to begin with, right? And this is only uh, about 130 year time frame. It takes a long time to get that into the mineral soil where it would be more protected. But, you know, as it gets deeper into the litter layer, it gets to the interface between the mineral soil and the organic matter. Um, you know, it takes a lot to burn off that litter layer and then get to that charcoal. Um, but we weren't finding it in the mineral soil, so it's still a short time frame, and we're not, we weren't picking it up in the mineral soil. Here's another example. Um, Tinker and Knight found that in Yellowstone National Park, they had a standing biomass of about 40 tons per acre. They had 8% charcoal rate. So before it was about 1 to 10 percent. These guys found 8 percent in the Yellowstone Park. Um, and it, it was about 9 tons per acre on the ground, which is pretty close to that 10 tons per acre that I told you was the published rate for how much we should leave behind. And they had a yield of about 1.5 tons per acre of charcoal added in just a single fire. So, um, so maybe you're not doing um, landscape you're not doing broadcast burn. You know, I, I heard yesterday that people are still kind of iffy about doing prescribed fires because they can explode at a moment's notice. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's cheap and easy for us to do some slash pile burning. And um, there's a lot of places around the West that, thanks, there's a lot of places around the West that have um, 
charcoal, uh, that have burn scars that are huge um, from slash piles that were burned more than 50 years ago. They're still a legacy on the landscape, and they're not productive forest sites. They're not holding water. They're not growing plants. They're mostly invasive weeds. Um, and so um, we figured out that you could build a better slash pile um, by modeling this after Jack Daniel's Ricks, where you know, they make charcoal to filter their whiskey. Um, but you have to put something big on the soil surface to keep the heat away from the soil, um, burn the slash pile from the top down, have a pumper crew or a pile of soil nearby so you could quench the fire and produce biochar. And we were pretty successful. This is August on the Umpqua National Forest. Here's where we raked out the biochar, and here's where we didn't. The understory is still green in August. So we added about a month onto the growing season for this site. Um, so here's an example of um, typical piles versus biochar. So typical piles, we were able to increase soil moisture, eh, maybe 1%, not any more than that, maybe 1% charcoal production. Um, by intentionally building slash piles to produce biochar, we had about a 5 to 10% conversion rate and an increase of about 3 to 7% in soil moisture content. So can we build soil water by making charcoal? Uh, sure, we're going to be like SpongeBob. Um, Biochar, charcoal, whatever you want to use, holds a lot of water. And it builds soil aggregates, so you have better infiltration, improves soil biodiversity, and increases, um, decreases soil erosion from a site. So a lot of positives for adding charcoal. Um, and of course, it's texture dependent. I, I want to point out that this study had been done um, looking at soil moisture content and carbon content. Um, all soils kind of you know, have an increase in soil moisture content, but certainly it depends on what soil texture you start with. Um, and silty soils were the best ones that responded. You know, sandy soils, you kind of reach a maximum. You can't do any better than that. Um, so at the landscape scale, there's um, some work do, being done in Montana with uh, Bob Marshall Wilderness, um, intentionally managing wildfire in the wilderness and doing prescribed fires in the wilderness and outside the wilderness in, on national forest lands to intentionally build charcoal. They've noticed that in places that they've had three reburns, um, that soil moisture content is much higher, and they're able to um, moderate the pulse of water moving into the Missouri River. And so, you know, it's just land managers had noticed this, and so they've asked us for help to actually quantify how much water is moving across these landscapes. I'm speeding it up because I'm almost out of time. <laughs> so um, we have to understand charcoal, um, quantify what it is post-harvest. We could certainly do that. And then we have to think about what are those combustion requirements that will maximize charcoal production. So some of those are high fuel moisture, um, tightly fat packed fuels with low aeration, um, or high lignin cellulose ratio. Those things would give you the maximum amount of um, charcoal. Or, or you could do some mild prescribed fire that would also produce a lot of charcoal. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to kind of play with it. It would probably take some, you know, trial and error to maximize how much charcoal you have, but certainly we could do this on a landscape scale. And there's always slash piles. Right, so, um, so I think part of what we're trying to get at is that we can do sustainable harvesting to get at promoting carbon below ground. Um, we can slowly increase soil carbon levels to moderate the flow of water. Um, and I think part of that is that um, we can improve tree, green biomass cover on a lot of sites later into the growing season so we have less of an impact of um, wildfire. You know, I have to say, one of the other things about biochar is that it also reduces the number of invasive species um, and the amount of invasive species. So we could also change um, ecosystem dynamics that way. So I want to thank you for listening, and uh, I dig healthy soil. So, do I have time for questions? Yeah, I have time for questions. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so the question was, you know, should we leave more than the 10 tons per acre? There's been some work done to refine that 10 tons per acre by habitat type here in the West, um, and some of it goes up to about 12 to 15 tons per acre. Um, but, you know, some of it, the wildfire, the 
the fire management officers get kind of antsy if you say, oh, I want to leave 20 tons per acre of down wood on my site. So, you know, it's got to be kind of a balancing act for, you know, can you produce more charcoal versus, um, you know, how much do you want to risk having a wildfire? But yeah. Sir, yeah, Darren. <laughs> Yeah. This is really important stuff. And, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and of course, you know, it's a direct way to sequester carbon below ground for thousands of years, right? And that's part of the issue with climate change is, yeah, we can, we can plant a lot of trees, but I think we got to plant a lot of trees, but we also have to think about what can we do with the soil and sequestering carbon below ground. So, yeah, we get kind of both. Uh, I saw this hand and then that hand. I like that. <laughs> um, so there's um, actually a surface uh, monitoring protocol for charcoal. And you can easily do it with uh, photo points or, um, uh, you know, I can send you the link to the article that talks about um, charcoal production and how you measure that. But yeah, and, um, you know, so you, you can also figure it out by, you know, doing some rough estimates of how, what your conversion rate might be on your species and in your land type and, and start thinking about, well, okay, so I'm gonna get a 10% conversion or a 20% conversion to charcoal and here's what it's adding. Yeah. So we're actually gonna move forward with okay. presentations. So but meet, meet me for beer, no, meet me in the, <laughs> at break. There's no beers at break. But, uh, <laughs> There's no beers.